Today, um, we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up there. It's been said that our hearts are most revealed by the things that make us sad and the things that make us celebrate. Well, today we're looking at a passage that has both tears and celebration, weeping and singing. Today we're in Revelation chapter five. This is the end of an incredible journey that we've been on together as a church family called 27 in 22. It's a, a year-long reading plan that we, uh, that we started at the very beginning of 2022. And uh, while this is our last sermon from that series, the, the plan actually goes all the way through the end of December, so I hope you'll finish strong with it. And uh, our, our goal in, in doing all of this was we wanted to be a people who are shaped by the word and let the word of God transform us to look like Jesus, to look more like his son, to look more like the one who has saved us. I was talking uh, with Pastor Steve a couple weeks ago and we were just wondering, um, and I wonder how many people uh, are still tracking with the 27 and 22 reading plan. And we're not gonna do a show of hands or anything like that and I'm almost hesitant to even bring it up because what the whole point of it was not to get to this moment and say, all right, line up, we're gonna pass out certificates. Everybody who finished, great job. That's not the goal. The, the goal is to immerse ourselves in the word of God, and that goal continues. Um, I, I really hope that, uh, that it was beneficial to you. I've been very blessed by the stories of people who've, who have said that God has met them in their times of studying the word. But the real test for me, for you, for all of us is gonna be not did we complete a plan or did we finish a plan or did we hang tight, but rather in the year to come, will we, will we be obedient to the things we've learned? Because that's the real measure of success for us. And so with that, uh, we are jumping in. Um, now you may be thinking to yourself that a, a passage from the book of Revelation this close to Christmas may seem a bit odd. Well, let me tell you why I don't think it is. I'd like to suggest to you that this is a perfect place for us to be today. The book of Revelation was written by John while he was on the island of Patmos. He was exiled there because of following Jesus. And he wrote the book of Revelation so that the Christians who would read this letter would be encouraged in the face of great difficulty and great persecution. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, I don't know if you uh, feel a sense of hesitancy or maybe even fear towards the book. Uh, and if you do, you're not alone. The book of Revelation has been the source of many debates uh, for centuries. And, and yes, for good reason, there's a ton of theology within this book. And uh, in particular, uh, a, a branch of theology called eschatology. That just means the study of end times. But what I can tell you for sure is that this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was not written to be a riddle to be solved. It was not written to scratch a theological or an intellectual itch that just a select few might have. It was written to Christians who were in very real situations and they were struggling. And what they didn't need was a letter full of theories. What they needed was something that they could receive that would point their eyes to Jesus. And in doing so, help them find the courage and the faith that they needed to be faithful even in times of difficulty. When you really get into it, the book of Revelation, it can be difficult, but if we're being honest, a lot of times the difficulty is because deep down, we doubt that God can or God would or God will intervene into history in such dramatic fashion. You read it and it's, 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 it, it, it can almost feel like too much. Questions that rise up within us are, is God truly concerned with what's going on right here, right now and all around us? Is he really Lord of all creation? Is there really a plan being worked out? You see, as you read this, I understand how it could be daunting. How could it be encouraging to, in the face of persecution and suffering to hear Christ is gonna return when deep down, I just don't know if that's true. I, I, I doubt. And if you've ever been in that place, then listen, it's Christmas. 
It's Christmas that reminds us and opens our heart and our eyes to the reality that we can place our faith in Christ's return because he's already came once. That's what Christmas does for us. Christmas reminds us that God will intervene in history. How and why? Because he already has. 2,000 years ago in some stable, the God of the universe stepped into our world and that <laughs> paved the way for all the truth that we're gonna look at today, all the truth that we build our life on, it began and found its climax in Christmas. And so that's why we look at it today. Um, if you've ever had the experience of holding together two, two conflicting things, a confident hope in the Lord and an undeniable realization that things just aren't turning out the way that I thought they would. If you've ever had to hold those things together, the book of Revelation is for you. If you've ever struggled with that, well, what do I do when my expectations and reality don't seem to match? Have I, have I missed God? Does this mean that God can't be trusted? Does this mean that God's not in control? Well, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John writes this today for your heart so that you would be encouraged. So let's look at uh, verses one through four. This is where we'll begin. This is what the word of God says, starting in verse one. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Verse four, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. The first thing that's gonna help us wrap our minds around uh, the initial part of this passage is this handle, this truth. What we see here is a grim reality. A grim reality. If you're taking notes in your worship guide, I got three little blanks, there you go. So what's going on here? John sees a scroll that is sealed up. And while we don't know the particulars of what exactly is written on this scroll, we know it's important. We know it's part of God's plan. We know that it's God mapping out his redemptive work for humanity and for all of history, but there's a problem. It's sealed up. And if this is God's plan, if, if this is God's plan to redeem and restore and no one can open it, then how is God's plan going to come to fruition? That is the problem. And the answer is it, it won't. It, it must be open. But by who? Listen, I hope you can feel the drama. That's, John wants you to feel it. The, the drama of this scene as it plays out. A mighty angel is crying out, who is worthy? The answer is no one. No one. No one can open the scroll. And so John wept. He's overcome. He's weeping. John wants you and I to feel how bleak and how desperate life would be if the scroll remained sealed. A sense of hopelessness and despair and grief is gripping him in this moment. And the text says he wept and he wept. And the reason that no one in all of creation can open the scroll is why? Well, the text says because no one was found worthy before God. Now the word found suggests a court of law where one stands before a judge. And the reality is, there is no person without sin. There is no person who is, can stand before God on their own merit and with their own resume. And so therefore, no one can open this scroll. Now, if you've been with us before, you know there's some good news coming. Yeah, you just do. But before we get there, don't don't rush past this moment. We need to feel the tension. You and I, as we read this, we need to feel. Don't exhale just yet because this is, this is a, a, a tough moment and it's meant to open our eyes to a spiritual truth that apart from Jesus Christ, there is no one in heaven or on earth who is worthy to open the scroll, 
who is worthy to stand before God. Now, this morning, today, right here, right now, I don't know where you're looking to for hope. I don't know what you're placing your hope in, what you're reaching for, what you're hoping will satisfy you and and give you the longing of your heart. But there is no hope apart from Christ. There is no hope apart from Christ. He is the only one who can provide what we need for us. If, if your hope is rooted in your job, in your family, in your status, in your belongings or credentials or any of this, it's just going to fall short. Today, if you're looking for validation and looking for significance from a spouse, let me just ruin your day, okay? They're gonna let you down. It's just how it is. If you're looking to your kids to give you a sense of identity, a sense of worth, a sense of purpose, they're gonna let you down. Maybe you're looking at grandkids for a sense of legacy, for a sense of identity, for a sense of accomplishment. They're going to let you down. Now, all of these relationships and more, they're they're all important. And I hope every single one of us today will take very seriously the roles that we've been called to. Take very seriously our job to be a godly spouse, a loyal friend, a watchful parent, and an encouraging grandparent. These are all really good things. They're just not enough. They cannot satisfy your heart. And this is a grim reality that all of us have to come face to face with. We need to deal with it. We need to not skirt around this, the truth that there is no hope and no salvation apart from Christ. My prayer today is that the Holy Spirit will convince you of this truth before you have to put it to the test. Because the reality is there's some some people who will just resist the Lord and they'll place their hope in this area or this area in this area. And I'm telling you, there's gonna come a point when all of that falls short. And my prayer is that you will trust the Lord sooner rather than later. Now, we see John weeping here. Can we just take a quick aside, a little sidebar on weeping? Can we do that? I know for some of you, this has been a really extremely difficult year. It's been tough. Filled with trial, maybe loss, grief, diagnosis, all sorts of things. I want you to hear me. No one expects you to go through the Christmas season without shedding some tears. That is quite all right. Not only are you allowed to do that, it may very well be the thing that you need to do. I know that there are many who, this is the first holiday without a certain loved one. And when we cry, when we weep, when we come before God with our broken heartedness, it does certain things for us, but one thing it does for us is it reminds us that this place is not our home. And that's a a good reminder. And so I'm just trying to say this. If that's you, if you find yourself in that difficult season right now, We see you and we're praying for you, so let it out. No one expects you to keep it together this holiday season, okay? Let's press on. This is a grim reality and it's something that we all face. It's not something that anybody desires, but it comes to us. The grim reality that we see depicted from the scripture here is real. It's real, we don't wanna deny it, but I'm so thankful that it's not the end of the story. Do you still have your Bible open? Let's look at verses five through eight. The scene continues and it says, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. 
So what started as a grim reality now turns into a confident reminder. A confident reminder. Think about John in this scene as he's caught up and as all this is revealed to him. John, he's a follower of Jesus. He's a faithful witness, even in exile. He wasn't vacationing on Patmos. He was exiled there because of his faith. And he has lived his life with a single hope rooted in Jesus, which may very well explain another aspect of his weeping that we see in the text here. You see, if there is no one who is worthy to open the scroll, then John, everything that he's built his life on has been built in vain, that he has hoped in vain if no one can open the scroll. But what we know is that his hope was not in vain. And the thing that addressed his tears was this reminder that came swiftly and with familiarity. Look, here we see John reassured of what he knew to be true, that Jesus reigns. And that's the reminder that transforms the whole experience. Are you with me? Listen, one of the elders comes to him and just gently points out, there is one who is worthy. Look, look, see, behold, the lion. And as this text unfolds, we see three different titles for Jesus being ascribed to him. The symbols and the images that John uses here, they're all very rich with meaning. The first, the lion of the tribe of Judah, reaches all the way back to Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob prophetically gave the scepter to Judah. That is the the right to rule. It became the, the tribe of kings. The image of the lion speaks of dignity and sovereignty and courage and victory. He says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he says, but he's also the root of David, which means he brought David and David's line into existence. As far as Jesus's humanity is concerned, Jesus had his roots in David, but as far as his deity is concerned, David, he was the root of, of David. It's this huge idea, and all of it is meant to do this. John's main purpose is is this. Everything prophesied in the Old Testament is now revealed and fulfilled in Jesus. The Messiah who was promised, it's him. He's the lion. He's the root of David. He, He reaches all the way back. It's like the Bible's all connected. It's like it's one big story. And so he says, behold, See, look, over there. But when John looks, he just said there is a lion, but what does he see? What does he see when he turns? He says, I looked, and instead of seeing a lion, I saw what appeared to be a lamb. And that's the third image that we see here. And the theme of the lamb runs throughout scripture. It represents the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, If you think about the Old Testament with me, in in Genesis 22, we see this great question uh, when they were up and Abraham and Isaac, he's about to sacrifice his son and the question is posed, where is the lamb? Fast forward to the New Testament, John chapter one, John the Baptist cries out, behold, the lamb of God. We read that, behold, the lamb of God. And then in the section that we're about to read after this, Right here in chapter five, we see it moving from behold the lamb to the whole choir of heaven singing worthy is the lamb. There's a theme that runs throughout scripture here. The way this lamb is described, I gotta be honest, sounds about a bit odd to us, right? Nobody takes this description and and then paints their nursery mural with it, right? The the seven horns and seven eyes. It, it It would just be a startling image to paint on the wall. But what John's doing here is he's trying to convey a spiritual truth. You gotta remember that in the Bible, the number seven is used to represent perfection, represent completeness. And so when it says this, what he's saying is, Jesus, the lamb, has perfect power. That's what the horns represent, the seven horns. Perfect power. Perfect wisdom, that's the seven eyes. He can see perfect wisdom wisdom and perfect or complete presence. That's the seven spirits as they go out. You know, as we think about these things, 
These qualities are all referred to as we systematize this as omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. These are all attributes of God. And that's what John's trying to help us see, is that this is no mere lamb. This is God in the flesh. Now I want us to key in on one main detail here that serves as the basis for this confident reminder. This was a lamb who had been slain. That's huge. This is a lamb looking as if it had been slain. That's what the text says it, right? What is it that gives us hope? And I'm talking about today, right here, right now. What is it that gives us hope when our life seems to be filling with despair? What is it that comes in and holds us, that we cling to so that we will not be washed away by the storms of life? It's the cross that is our anchor. If you are a child of God, the cross is the anchor that holds you firm no matter what happens. He says, I looked and I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took the cross and, and, and changed it from being just a symbol Now today we look at it, and there are those who look at it as a symbol of dry religion, but we see the cross as the means by which God has brought forth his plan of salvation. What I'm trying to say is this, I really do believe, I really do, that the cross of Jesus changes everything. Of course it changes our eternal destiny, that's true, but it changes our right here and our right now. It's a truth that's meant to impact our lives in this very moment. What was meant to be an object of shame was actually the means of our redemption. Talking about the cross. What seemed like defeat, the lamb's been slain. It's an instrument of death. We know it as the way that God brought victory to his people. For many today, what looks like the trappings of religion, if you think about Christianity and a Uh, A world religion sense, yeah, the cross. Listen, we see that and we know that that is is not just something that we decorate our homes with or or cling to um, out of some rote religion. That is the means by which God has offered us a life-giving and life-changing relationship with Almighty God. It is the cross that changes everything. Jesus Christ died so that you and I might live That single truth is the greatest gift, the greatest news the world has ever received. And today, as we just think about the book of Revelation, I'm not not trying to give you a theology lesson, I'm trying to give you a gospel invitation. That when we build our lives on Jesus and the cross, it changes everything. I'm telling you, I I don't want you just to know about the lamb. I want you to be known by the lamb. This is the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus Christ, as the perfect lamb of God, offered up himself so that he could bring forgiveness to you and to me. Guys, when we think about that, when we dwell on that, the only proper response for you and for me, is to adopt the posture of the elders, to fall down on our face in worship. Which leads us to the next section. Let's read nine through 14. This is what the word of God says in response to all of this. Verse nine says, and they sang a new song, saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor 
and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. So we have this grim reality that's transformed by a confident reminder that leads us to a joyous refrain. Because if, if you don't like singing, I suggest that you maybe warm up to the idea. Because our God is worthy. Like, think about that. Our God is worthy of us gathering in this place and singing songs about how wonderful and glorious and mighty he is. I, I know that may sound super simple, but for me, it, it's always just struck me that we, would, that we would lift up songs about who he is and what he has done. Now, the lamb, when the lamb comes and he takes the scroll, the weeping turns to praising. Guys, I don't wanna get hung up on weeping again, but I'm, I just need you to hear. You can praise while you weep. I don't think that those things are mutually exclusive. I believe that following Jesus involves both. That if you commit your life to him, that, that that's not a free pass on trials, that there will still be weeping and there will still be sadness. But you can praise in the middle of it. And I, I know that that may seem heavy, if you're right in the middle of the storm, but there are people in this congregation who can blow you away with their story, with their testimony of faith. I believe that you can praise and you can weep. You don't have to stop weeping before you start praising. Francis Schaeffer says this, our trusting the Lord does not mean that there are not times of tears. I think it is a mistake as Christians to act as though trusting the Lord and tears are not compatible. Now, I hope the person who needs to hear this will take this to heart today. God sees your tears. You do not have to hide them. You can come praising, you can come weeping. But I need you to know that there's something that happens to us in the middle of that praising. When the lamb reminds us of who he is, what he's done, and it makes a difference. In response here, in this passage, to the lamb taking the scroll, we read that they sang a new song, a new song before the Lord. In the Old Testament, God's people would sing new songs when he intervened. They would sing new songs as he would save and deliver. And here, a new song is being sung because God has done a new work for those who belong to him. Christ on the cross is God's decisive work of salvation and the cross of Jesus stands as the centerpiece of God's redemptive work in history. And so we sing songs today about the cross. We sing songs about Jesus. We sing songs about what he has done. Why should we sing? Why should we praise? To say it just as plainly as possible. Because he is worthy. Because he is worthy. The text gives us the reason. It says why the lamb is worthy. It's because he is the slain lamb. Who, look at it, what it says, with his own blood purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. This here is the gospel. This is, is the good news that your heart and my heart desperately need. We were enslaved to sin and yet Jesus paid the price. This is why we sing, this is why we give, this is why we go, this is why the good news can't stay here. We've gotta take it to the world. This is why things like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering are so important, because this is not just good news for us. This is good news that comes with a mission that ought to propel us into the world. May we be a people who are always burdened for taking the gospel to the ends of the world. And so, shameless plug, Lottie Moon. And this passage ends with praise. That's how chapter five concludes. There's a lot of singing. There's a whole bunch of it. They're praising and declaring the glory of God and they are attributing all honor to Jesus. And rightly so. Now think about this with me. John, he's exiled on this island. He's writing a message to Christians who are persecuted. They are under 
attack. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his purpose here is to encourage. What exactly is so encouraging about this? How today, for us, believers, how is it that this is something that gives us encouragement? Well, we hold on to and we build our life on and we cling to this truth that no matter what you're going through, no matter what comes into your life, no matter how grim the situation, the cross of Jesus changes everything. Our, our greatest need has been met in Jesus. Our hope is anchored in the person of Jesus and in the work that he accomplished long ago. So I don't have to wake up tomorrow morning and wonder, am I gonna have enough hope for the day? Am I gonna find something that satisfies me? Am I gonna find a source of hope? No, he stands as an eternal source of hope. Because of Jesus, there is no storm that can wash me away. There is no grief too heavy that I can't endure it. There's no suffering so great that it could ever separate me from the love of God. That's what this is about. The key to all of history as revealed in Revelation chapter five is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, if Christ had not died, if Christ had not been risen again, then we would still be in our sins. We would have no hope, no promise of new life. It's easy to think that Revelation is mostly a book about outlandish prophecies and strange visions and this and that. But the book is about this, Christ the Redeemer. And if you're going through a difficult time, if you're in the middle of a, a grieving season or a, a season of persecution, you fix your eyes on Jesus because God has a plan. His plan is not frustrated. His plan will come about. His timing is perfect. And guys, that's what Christmas reminds us of as well. You see, part of what Revelation is, is screaming at us is this, he's coming back again. He's coming back. Well, how can you be so sure? Well, he came once. I'm not trying to say that flippantly. That's what Christmas is all about, that the God of the universe stepped in. And so guys, as we celebrate this Christmas season, we gotta remember that Christ is worthy, that he is worthy, that his blood covers and invites every person and tribe and nation into a life-changing relationship with him. That's worth singing about. That's worth praising him for. Each and every year as we come and we decorate and in all the trappings of Christmas, we are reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of our God, that he, he did come and he does offer us a, a plan of salvation. The most important thing that you can do this year for Christmas is to remind yourself of the gospel and to praise Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. I pray that this fills your heart with encouragement today. As we prepare to respond, I want you to hear this. If you need to close your eyes, if you need to, to put down whatever's in your hand, go to the Lord in this moment and, and hear the encouragement that is found from scripture. Today, are you grieving? Look, the lion of Judah, the lamb who was slain. Are you frustrated with God today? Look, the lion of Judah, the lamb who was slain. Are you overwhelmed with the pressures and trials of life? Then look, the lion the lamb who was slain? Are you praying for the salvation of a spouse? Look, the lion of Judah, the lamb who was slain. Are your kids far from God today? Look, the lion of Judah, the lamb who was slain. Are you entering into a season that's filled with uncertainty and fear and questions? Look, the lion of Judah, the lamb who was slain.
because that's what we've been given. A crucified and risen Savior who is worthy of your trust. So build your life on him. And I pray that this Christmas season that he will remind you of that and that he'll capture up your heart and your mind with those truths. He is the lamb who is on the throne. I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna sing just a bit. Guys, we, we call this our time of response because if you're here today and if I can pray with you, if I can pray for you, I would love to do that. I'm gonna be right here in the front. There's gonna be other ministers as well. We want you to respond to what it is that God is calling you to do. Maybe this all sounds great, but you know in your heart that you have never trusted Jesus as Savior. If that's you, I invite you to come and let's take a step of faith. Let us share with you what it means to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. Maybe you wanna join this church. Maybe you just would like to pray for somebody who God has laid on your heart. Let's be obedient to what God has called us to do today. We're gonna sing. Please don't run out. We've got a few things at the end of service we need to share with you, and so stay tight. But let's not rush past this moment as we go to the Lord and we ask him to speak to us. Father, we say thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we will not miss you this Christmas season, that every carol we sing, every decoration we enjoy, every moment of family time will remind us that you are worthy, that every good gift comes from you and no trial enters into our life that could ever separate us from you. And so Father, I pray that you would hold your children very tightly today. Help us to trust you and to be faithful to all that you're doing in us and through us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus.